All right, so let's talk about Velaki. There is a lot going on in this town. It's basically the central hub of the entire game. If Death House and the Village of Barovia were the tutorial and introduction levels, respectively, then Velaki's the start of the game proper. Now, there's, like I said, a lot going on in this town. There's a lot of events, a lot of NPCs, a lot of quest hooks. Now, that combined with the sheer length of the chapter, which is, by the way, second only to Castle Ravenloft, makes this a daunting prospect for a lot of dungeon masters. But I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be a big deal if you prepare for it properly. Now, I'll tell you this right off the bat. Velaki's a place that your players are probably going to come back to time and time again. So don't feel like you have to throw everything at them within the first three days of their arrival. They're going to come back, so save some content for later. Now, in this video, I'm going to walk you through preparing for Velaki and give you some tips on how to run it, how to get the most out of it. So stay tuned. And this is going to be one of the longer videos, so go ahead and use the table of contents that I've got here on the side to uh, figure out where you need to go, where you are, and feel free to jump back and forth as you see fit. Now, the first step in preparation is to actually read the chapter. Go figure. If you haven't done that, go make yourself a nice cup of tea, pause the video, read it through, and come back. I'll wait. Once you've read the entire chapter, it's time to make three lists. The first is a list of all of the locations that are within Velaki or just outside of it. There are 10 of them in the chapter. Go ahead and add Lake Zarovich to make that 11. Your players might end up going back there. Now, for each of those locations, jot down some notes for things that the players might find there. Pay special attention to the Burgomaster's Mansion, the Walker House, and the Coffin Shop. These are areas that have a lot going on in them, so you'll want to know them back to front. Go ahead and add any additional locations that you might add to Velaki. For example, I added the Orphanage from Reddit user MandyMod. There's a link to that and her other works in the description down below. Check it out. And we'll be talking more about the Orphanage later on in the video. The next list contains all of the quests and plot hooks that could be found in and around Velaki. This is a quick reference for you to figure out what your players came here to do, where they can go, and good or bad outcomes on each of those. I'll put a link in the description to a chart of all of the default quests and plot hooks that you can find. Feel free to add and remove from it as you see fit. Big thanks to Reddit user Dragna Carta for coming up with the chart to begin with. You'll find a link to his stuff as well. The third list that you're gonna make is of all of the NPCs in town. This is gonna include notes about their mannerisms and personalities, as well as where they might be found under given circumstances or at certain times of day. There are a lot of NPCs, you'll find out, and you're not going to want to make detailed notes on all of them. So your next preparation task is to decide who is important. And we're going to be doing that by splitting the NPCs of Velaki into three groups. Not every NPC in Velaki is of equal importance, and there's a lot of them. There are 38 named NPCs in total, including a horse and a monkey. This is perhaps even an excessive amount. Now, you cannot... Well, you could, but I don't recommend it. You, you, you shouldn't expend a lot of time and effort fleshing out each one of these down to every last minute detail. So let's split them up into three groups, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Up first is our primary group of NPCs. These are the ones that your players are going to interact with the most or on multiple occasions. You should know these characters backwards and forwards, and each one should have their own unique and very identifiable personality. Next, you have your secondary NPCs. These are ones that you should recognize, your players should recognize, but they may only encounter them on one occasion. So put a little bit of effort into them, learn their backstory, give them you know, some sort of unique personality, but don't sweat it if your players don't run into them. Lastly, you have your tertiary NPCs. This is basically everybody else that isn't primary or secondary. These are your background extras. You could use them as you know a name dropping reference, cannon fodder, or just do away with them altogether. Except Piccolo the monkey, you, you have to keep him. 
So those are your preparation steps. Next is actually running Velaki. And I've got a few tips for changes and additions to the town that will help you out and hopefully make a more enjoyable experience for you and your players. Now, one thing I want to interject here is we have recently started a Patreon. There's a link to it down below. If you want to support the videos, go ahead and become a patron. We'd really appreciate it. In addition, we are offering high quality 3D rendered maps of various RPG locations, both original and not so original. So go ahead and check it out. First up, we're going to add some shops. Now, one of the big problems for Velaki, at least in my opinion, is the <laughs> almost complete lack of shopping. Now, I know that Barovia isn't exactly a bustling center of commerce and resource scarcity is part of the whole horror shtick, but Velaki is the kind of town that's gotta have a lot more going on than just a toy shop and a general store. First up is the blacksmith. This guy's going to sell some low-grade weapons and armor that have been scavenged from the bodies of dead adventurers. It's all torn and beat up and a little rusted, but it'll do in a pinch. The blacksmith here is good at repairs and shoeing horses, but he's not a weaponsmith, so he's not going to have any original high-quality weapons to sell them. He can, however, silver the party's weapons if they can provide the silver. Next up is a bowyer. If you've got a rogue in your party, this is where they're going to pick up some ranged weapons or some more ammunition. This is also the store that outfits the wolf hunters that your players find in the Blue Water Inn. Next is a clothier. If your party's planning to hike up Mount Gaucus to the Amber Temple, they're going to need some warm clothes to avoid freezing to death, and this is the place where they're going to get it. In addition, they could get some nice fancy clothes to dress up for their arrival at the Baron's house or the Walker house. And maybe even those fancy clothes can give them an advantage in social interactions. Lastly is the apothecary. The Velaki apothecary really isn't that good at what he does. In fact, he's not really an apothecary at all. He's more of a snake oil salesman. He's got a few tinctures here and there, but mostly he just tries to scam money out of the players. He does, however, have a few rare gems in his collection, such as Powdered Silver and Alchemist's Fire, although he doesn't really know what to do with it. All right, so that does it for the shops, and here's our next addition. So, being a kid in Barovia is brutal at best. It's even worse when you're an orphan. Now, this is the orphanage edition from Reddit user Mandymod that I mentioned earlier. It's a very popular edition amongst the community, but I've got a few editions of my own that I think will spice it up just a bit. I really like the orphanage because it adds additional quest hooks into the werewolf den later on in the module, and it makes the Bones of St. Andrew quest a lot harder, because let's face it, that thing's a cakewalk. Now, in order to pull this off, we have to make some changes to Milovage's background and his motivations. In our Velaki, Milovaj works at the orphanage as a part-time caretaker. He grew up there and just never left. After three boys recently disappeared, he went out to contract the wolf hunters at the Blue Water Inn to go find them. In order to get the gold, he was manipulated by Ernst Larnack into stealing the bones of St. Andrew and giving them to the coffin maker. To complicate matters, Milovaj has recently fallen ill and now lies catatonic in his bed at the orphanage. In order to find the bones, players are going to have to find a cure for him, and wake him up. Now, it's not as simple as just cure disease or even a restoration spell. Milovaj is under attack by a demon trying to eat his soul. Inside the orphanage, players are going to find the stern headmistress Claudia Belasco. She's got a stony exterior, but a heart of gold. She's up to her ears in problems. Not only is she dealing with a catatonic Milovaj, but she's got pervasive nightmares amongst the children, and mysterious bruises that are popping up all over their bodies. If the party investigates the children and the orphanage, they'll eventually find Felix, a recent addition to the orphanage within the past several weeks. He's in possession of a locket that, turns out, is also home and prison to a shadow demon. It's this shadow demon that is preying on the soul of Milovaj in order to release itself. It is also preying on the children as they sleep, giving them bad dreams and having Felix carve glyphs onto the tops of the bedposts. When the players confront Felix, 
they'll eventually have to fight against the Shadow Demon. If the demon feels that the players are too big of a threat, it'll try to escape with Felix into the hustle and bustle of Vallaki. If the players kill the demon, then Felix is no longer under its sway, Milovaj's soul is put back into his body and he wakes up and everything's okay. However, if the demon escapes and disappears, he and Felix hole up in the church graveyard. If the players don't find Felix and the demon within the graveyard in 1d4 days, then Milovaj dies and the demon is released from his prison and the locket. At that point, he takes full control of Felix and then begins to hunt down the recently adopted orphans. One family will die for 1d4 plus 3 nights. After a couple of days, the townsfolk demand justice. The Baron not knowing what else to do, decides to capture and arrest Claudia Belasco and attempts to burn her at the stake in some form of mock justice. Now, obviously, burning Claudia at the stake isn't going to stop anything. In fact, the demon will continue killing until it runs out of families or until the players stop it. If the players fail to stop the demon, it leaves town and holds up in the Amber Temple for a future confrontation. Our next addition to Velaki is Vasily von Holtz. If you didn't already know, Vasily is Strahd's alter ego. Strahd uses him to move undetected amongst the people of Barovia and even act as his own diplomatic representative. During the game, Vasily is a great way for Strahd to interact with your players, gather information, and just generally screw with them. Go ahead and introduce him any time on the road after Old Bone Grinder, or even within Velaki as a friendly face. Vasily, on the surface, seems like a great guy. He's super helpful, he's very informative, he's polite, and he even works as a local accountant. <laughs> Get it? Accountant? <laughs> uh, never mind. Being Strahd, he's always working against the party in some subtle fashion. He's either sowing discord, or putting them on the wrong track, or just trying to woo Irina away from them. Now, a popular method of screwing with the players in the guise of Vasily is to send them out on a sort of fetch quest. You see, Vasily is waiting for a shipment that never came. So when the players go out to find it, they encounter a ruined wagon that has been torn apart. And the, really, the only thing left intact is a suit of plate armor. Now, this plate armor is, of course, a perfect size for the party's fighter or paladin or whomever wears it. But it is, in fact, Strahd's animated armor. And if the player dons it, all Strahd has to do at an opportune moment is say a command word, and the armor turns against its owner. Now, of course, you have some players that are really cunning and quick on the uptake, and they will probably suspect Vasily. If they don't know that Strahd can walk around in the Barovian daytime, having them encounter Vasily during the daytime will help throw them off the tracks. And having Vasily interact with Irina on the church grounds, at least while the bones are gone, is also a great way to throw them off the scent. Despite Strahd's skill in disguising himself, there are a couple of things that can out Vasily. The first is a letter in Wachter House from Vasily von Holtz to uh, Lovina Wachter. Now, this is a really old letter, and the handwriting on it matches the Tome of Strahd. So, Players can definitely connect the dots there. Another way to out Vasily is his house. He actually owns real estate within Velaki proper. If your players follow him to the house, uh, they'll find the house to be locked up like nothing else. If they do, however, manage to get inside, they'll find the house completely empty with a thick layer of dust covering everything. Nobody's been in here for ages. So... Definitely a red flag for Mr. Vasily von Holtz. Our last big change to Velaki is the Feast of St. Andrew. Now, the first change to the feast is its timeline. In the module, it's supposed to take place the same night as the Festival of the Blazing Sun. In my opinion, that's way too soon. I recommend pushing it out to 10 days after the arrival of the players. Don't even have anybody notice that the bones of St. Andrew are missing until seven days. Now, that seven-day period gives you time for the players to get complacent. They feel as if Irina is in a safe place, but really, she's not. In fact, 
Strahd's been using that seven-day period to talk to her and woo her in the guise of a silly. Now, after that seven-day period, players can start hunting down the bones. If they fail, well, then the feast kicks off on day 10. Now, as I stated in a previous video, the changes that we're making to the module are all based around the idea that Strahd is burning the world down around Irina's ears in order to drive her into Castle Ravenloft and see it as a safe haven. Now, the feast is a great way to do this, but having Strahd be the main perpetrator, not the way to go about it. So instead, he sends a bride as a proxy to kick off the feast. In the event that your players fail to return the bones on time, have the bride Anastrasia start the attack on the church and kill Father Petrovich. Now, Anastrasia is a very cunning vampire. She's got a will of her own. She's not your normal vampire spawn. So, in addition to carrying out Strahd's orders and slaughtering innocents, she's also carrying out her own agenda. And that agenda is to kill Irina. You see, the brides are jealous of Strahd spending so much time and attention on this human woman and not them, and they want her dead. Now, when things seem most dire and blood covers the floor, Strahd, in the guise of Vasily, swoops in to save the day. If Anastrasia is there, she takes that opportunity to out Strahd as Vasily. Now, at that point, Strahd reluctantly drops his guise and begins the cleanup effort of controlling his minions. Now, this is either in the form of ordering them home or slaughtering them outright, whichever you think is more dramatic. When he's done getting things under control, he offers his hand to Irina and says, Please, get up. I apologize for this mess. Children will be children, after all. Now, at this point, Irina's probably not gonna accept his apology or his hand, and Strahd knows that. Now, this is a good time to either offer the dinner invitation to the party, or just have Strahd go, you know, crazy and kill everybody. That's up to you, really. So, there's obviously a lot going on here in Velaki, both rules as written and with this video as your guide. So, have fun, don't panic, and take your time. Space things out, and just have fun.